So I would like to welcome everyone to the uh, seminar of Tony Belpain. Uh, what how, actually, Tony? How do you pronounce Belpain? I say in Flemish, it's Belpama, uh, but all the English speakers have made Belpain out of it. So I, I like that. The rule with Dutch is that whatever it sounds it looks like, it sounds <laughs> it's not that. <laughs> Tony is professor at the uh, University of Ghent. Is it Ghent or Ghent? Um, Ghent in Flemish, Ghent in English. <laughs> University of Ghent and, and also uh, professor of cognitive uh, systems and robotics at Plymouth University, where uh, uh, Angelo Cangelosi, who's also here, was um, formerly professor. He's a member of IDL, uh, ID Lab, IMEC at Ghent, and is associated with the Center for Robotics and Neural Systems at Plymouth. His research interests include social systems, cognitive robotics, and artificial intelligence in general. In two, uh, 2012, his work was named in one of the, of the, the 10 life-changing ideas under research at UK universities by the Research Councils UK. And in 2014, his work was lauded as one of 20 new ideas from the UK that will change the world. So we're ready to hear him change the world. <laughs> the wheel to Tony Bell. So thank, you, thank you for having me. I'll share my slides in a moment. Um, it's re a real pleasure to be invited to this. Uh, I, I, I normally, I, 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 I'm typically always invited to conferences on interactive systems, human robot interaction. And so it's, it's great to be allowed to go back to an all the love of mine. So talking about um, the topics of this seminar series. So let me just see if I can, share my presentation. And there we go. So you should be seeing this. Yes, we see it. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, I came up with the title before I actually thought about what, what it was I was going to, <laughs> to talk about. So uh, bear with me. Uh, this, this is going to be more interesting than just this bland title. So let's first put my cards on the table. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, I, don't know, I, I don't know much about cognitive science. So I'm a, a computer scientist and an engineer. And um, I, I build robots nowadays, the artificial intelligence powering uh, social robots, and I build simulations. And, and as I do so, um, you always wonder about the you know, what, what is, is that makes humans tick? What is it that, that, cons, you know, that, that makes up human cognition? Um, and I've been doing this for 20 years, much to my surprise. And, uh, you know, to, to say it with uh, Albert Einstein, the more I learn, the less I seem to know. Um, and nowadays I, I work a lot with social robots. So robots such as you know, this one um, where I, Use these robots to to support children in hospitals or trawler robots such as um, this pepper robot um, interested in in how close we can bring robots to uh, to, to, to to people so we're looking at androids um, or we're looking at how robots can develop uh, so for example this robot is a childlike robot and we look at how it can develop just like infants do um, and somehow I, I, I can't start this presentation without going back about 20 years to talk to you about categories and specifically color categories. Um, color categories are, 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 are fascinating. And, and I think categories that, that you know, as such um, are the start to human cognition. So it's important that we understand what they are and where they come from. Um, so as, as William James said um, a while ago now, uh, the world arrives at our senses as a blooming, buzzing confusion. Um, and yet we perceive a structured environment. If you look around you, you're going to see objects and colors and, and it, it isn't a big mess. There's, there's structure in what you see. And the, the, the mechanism that is responsible for that is categorization. So as soon as you have a sensory stream uh, coming in and you need to distinguish that sensory stream um, because you need to make a decision, you might be a worm needing to swim one way to get to the food or swim away from a predator, for example. Um, as soon as you make a distinction in of sensory information, you are categorizing and you have categories. And um, 
just to, to make things clear, um, people talk about categories and concepts. I use the two interchangeably. Um, you can try and, 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 and define both, but I don't, it's really difficult. No one seems to really agree on what a category or a concept is. So I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll just use them for one and the same thing. Now, the classic view on categories, you know, going back to the, the ancient Greek philosophers, is that um, a category is something that shares, you know, everything belongs to a category if it shares similar properties. Um, and categories are, you know, well delineated and you can group them together based on taxonomies. You can have hierarchies of categories and you can determine if something belongs to a category by following a series of questions. You know, if it, you know does, does it have four legs? Yes. Um, is it a, a farm animal? Yes. Um, do we milk it? I mean, do we make cheese out of the milk? Yes. Well, it must be a cow. Yeah. Um, and th this has had an, a tremendous impact on traditional artificial intelligence. So it, all the expert systems, knowledge representations assumed this classic view on categories and that you could, um, through formal logic and through answering questions, you know, based on that formal logic, um, uh, build a system that could have you know, representations of the world. And I've, I've noticed, I've, I just had a look at the speakers in the seminar series, and I noticed that Gary Lupian is uh, one of the speakers as well. And, I, and, and he has you know, some fascinating insights on that as well. So don't miss that. Now, um, yesterday, I, I just typed in the word chair in Google image search, and this is what I got. Yeah, you, you might get something different, but this is what it threw at me. So lots of chairs, some very typical chairs, some very odd chairs as well. You know, the, the scorpion chair there at the bottom. Um, and it's interesting, I think. There's, there's, you know, all these different things are chairs yeah, to Google, but also to us. And the problem seems to be that it's very difficult to define what a chair is. If you try to come up with a definition of what a chair is, you will probably, no, actually, I'll predict, you will fail. Yeah? You will not be able to come up with a definition of chair uh, to which I will not find an exception. Yeah? If you say like, oh, it needs to have four legs, then I go like, well, look, there's some chairs there that don't have four legs, or you need to be able to sit in it. Well, what about a very tiny chair that you can't really sit on it? We'd still call it a chair. You know? What if it's a very big chair or something? You know, this, this, you can't come up with a definition of a chair that um, meets those requirements of classic uh, theory of what a category is. Um, the only thing that they all seem to, to, to share is that we use the word chair to denote these object. So it seems that it is language that ties these things together. Also, you don't have very strict boundaries of these categories. Um, they're, they're, they're kind of more vague. And so that brings me to a second form of thinking of, of categories, and that is called prototype theory. Um, Eleanor Roche and colleagues kind of came with this idea in the 70s. And it's a very straightforward idea. Uh, so categories are, 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 you know, they don't have strict boundaries. They're not discrete. Um, instead, you have a prototype for a category, which is like a prototypical example of it, like a prototypical chair. Um, and then anything else that is, that belongs to that category has some form of membership to that prototype. So for example, if you would have the the, the, the category of bird, then chicken and penguin both belong to it, but chicken might be, you know, it might have a stronger membership than penguin. And objects can belong to more one, than one concept or one the more category. And you can have hierarchies as well. So you can have like animal and under that bird and under that sparrow. So uh, prototype th theory is quite flexible and it's, it's my preferred way of thinking of categories. Now, where do these categories come from? And there's you know, um, two ways of thinking about it. Some might say like, that categories are innate, or at least some categories are innate. Um, Tony, think, Tony, yes. Before you get to the learning in innate, would you be willing to answer a question? Absolutely. OK. Uh, one, it's, it's, I'm very gratified to hear you say that you use category and concept interchangeably and you don't really know what the difference would be if there were a difference so that's very good so we agree that categories are categories 
And then you gave these two uh, approaches to what it is that, I don't know, two approaches to categories. One was the so-called classical one, which is that categories are sets of things uh, with uh, features that they, that they share and that they don't share with their non-members. And then you said there's this other uh, approach, prototypes, in which you have a, uh, some sort of a prototypical member of the category and whether you're a member or not is a matter of degree. Yes. Uh, now, I would like to ask you, uh, in the, in the, and you cited Roche, and Roche, of course, did experiments on these, and she showed that for certain members of the category bird, it takes longer uh, to, uh, to decide whether it's a member, and they're described by people as being more typical members. But that is not categories, that's typicality, okay? I, I'm not surprised that prototypes are, are, are the uh, representation for typicality. But in the end, and although there may be for biologists things in the world that fly that they can't decide whether they're, whether they're, um, uh, whether they're reptiles or birds, and those are cases that we simply can't classify. But for the category bird and for the person on earth, it's an all or none thing. Something either is a bird or it's not a bird. The borderline cases for the taxonomists, they, say, they just say, I, you know, I don't know what it is. So that takes us back to the classical view. Um, yes. And in the I end, think I agree with you. Certainly, certainly for example, on bird. Um, but yeah, there, there, are, there are many things. I, you know, bird does have. So I, I, I wonder. I don't know. No, <laughs> I keep putting me on the spot here. Um, I actually think that it's not that hard. Of, I, I think we have come to an agreement on what bird is. Um, and it changes. Yeah, for, for example, I, I don't know, whales would be fish to most people unless you tell them that they're a mammal and then suddenly they flip from being fish to being a mammal. Um, and I, I think if something belongs to a category, we have agreed on this, and um, you and, and and still that doesn't meet the requirements. Oh, that doesn't you know it doesn't mean that we have that this is a classic category, as in um, it has features that it needs that they all need to share. Um, so I I, I think I th I think I subscribe to the prototype theory. And now the edge cases, there are you know, examples that might flip, that, that might just be tipped across the water into another category. Um, but I think we do so through agreeing, to, yeah, by, by agreeing to do so, not because there's some, some you know, unchangeable property that these uh, examples have that, that, that um, let me let me get back to that later. I yeah, think yeah, let's let's leave yeah. it for the discussion. But I just wanted to inject that note of dissonance at this. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so going back to um, the way you can arrive at your categories. So so um, some categories are going to be innate. You're going to be born with um, that. There might be you know a, a sense of hunger or a you know, gravity or something might have some form of, of, of might, might be, might have some form of representation with which you're born. You know, gravity has been around for long enough. Um, it wouldn't be, it, you know, it would be surprising if it isn't somehow already present in, in um, internally as some form of representation. I don't really want to argue on what represent, representation is. Um, but many of those categories and concepts are going to be learned. Yeah? Um, the internet, for example, you, know, you, you can't be born knowing what the internet is. So you learn that. Um, but what about categories that are kind of closer to perception, things such as color categories? Um, how would you learn those? And then you've got two options. Either you learn them empirically, so you, you, you learn what those categories are through experiencing them. So as um, you know, a young infant, you're ex experiencing the world, um, you're, you're, you're playing, you're pushing against things, you're seeing things, you're hearing things, and that shapes the way you will 
cut up the world. It cut, you know, that's, that's, that shapes how you cut up your, your perception. Or you cut up your perception based on interaction, uh, interactions with others. Yeah? And how would that happen? And um, that's the story, really, that I want to tell. So I want to convince you that most of the categories, perhaps, you know, really the large majority of the categories that we have, even the ones that you would think are, uh, are just learned through empirical interaction with the world, are still um, learned and shaped, specifically shaped by interacting with others. And so the question is, is it an empirical process, category learning, or a cultural process? You know, are others involved? Uh, and if you want to consider this in artificial intelligence terms or machine learning terms, is this unsupervised learning or supervised learning? Um, and let's look at the case for empirical learning, so unsupervised learning. So could, could, is that possible? Yes, it's theoretically certainly possible. You, you could um, have access to, to you know, experiences, sensory experiences, and you look at invariance and variance, and, and from that you extract the things that stay constant, and you that, those form a category. And it would require you know, a lot of training experiences, but um, and because of that, a lot of time, but it's theoretically not impossible. And I can imagine that this works for things such as uh, distinguishing edible from non-edible food, things like, I don't know, learning a concept like gravity, uh, forces, perhaps spatial concepts could be learned from just experiencing the world. Um, but as an argument against that, even the most basic perceptual categories don't always seem to be learned empirically. Color categories, for example, and I'll give you that example, I'll, I'll take that as a running example, um, uh, are learned by interacting with others and not just learn from interacting with the world. And uh, for most concepts, most concepts are, are, are notoriously hard to define, to determine. And so you've got this, in, you know, a concept is underdetermined. So um, I won't go into it, but this indeterminacy of reference, the, the, the whole Gabba guy story by Quine, um, you know, tells a really interesting story about that. Um, I don't think there's enough enough time to 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 learn the categories that we humans use. We 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 must use tens of thousands of categories um, on a, on a daily basis to go about our lives, to to think about our past, and to put, to make plans for the future. Um, I don't think you can learn them by just empirically interacting with the world. And also kind of Occam's razor. So if there's a simpler way of arriving at those categories, we will use it. And there is a simpler way. And so um, we can learn categories from each other. And this is where I need to, to give you the color example. So color is, is, is a great domain to think about. So it's, it's um, very well contained, it's very well studied and understood as well. So we know how color perception works, so we understand the, the neurophysiology of color perception. Um, and we know a lot about <coughs> how color language works. So we have uh, data from across the world, from, from very small languages that um, had very limited contact with other languages. We know how people, um, use color words there and what they refer to. And um, what we've seen over um, about 60 years of study is that there's a lot of universality in color categories. So what that means is that wherever you go in the world, um, you know, from, from the remotest jungle tribes in Irian Jaya to languages spoken by the Inuit, they will have words for the same colors yeah they will have they will have words for red and, and green and yellow and blue and white and black uh words that we have as well they might differ in how many color words they have um but um uh, there's there's a, a striking similarity in the the colors that these uh, words refer to so if uh, anthropologists take a color card like the one you see in your screen to a remote tribe and they say look You've got five color words in your language. Could you please mark what they mean? Yeah, and they put a cross on that chart. And you then kind of make a histogram of where all those crosses end up for 110 different, very different languages. You get something like this. Yeah, you get, you get this pattern there. Um, and it is not a flat surface, you see. So there, there are peaks on that histogram showing that many languages have uh, 
color words for the same colors. So they have color categories that overlap, which is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So it would almost mean that color categories are genetically determined, so that it's somehow in our genetic makeup. And I'll make an argument that that is not the case. And so um, categories are not innate. Uh, they're not empirically acquired, uh, acquired. They are acquired culturally. And it really kind of answering that question answers really big questions such as, you know, who decides on, on the meaning of words? Um, where do concepts really come from? How, how is it that we largely agree on the meaning of words? Yeah, this, this, this is actually, you know, this is not trivial. How, how is it that we agree on what red means or what chair or table means? Really, these, these are not trivial, trivial, yeah, trivial answers. Um, and the way I study this is through building computational models. So these are simple um, computer programs in which we have agents. And agent is um, a, a, a really stripped down version of a person. Um, an agent has a, a piece of code that allows it to perceive colors. It has some more code that allows it to categorize that perception, and then some more code that allows it to attach words to categories. And what we then do is we put several of these agents together in the simulation, and we let them communicate about something in a context. And I, the best way to explain this is through a small animation. Um, but let, let me just first talk to you about what kind of um, stuff we put in each agent. So we give each agent a color perception model called CIE little LAB. It's a three-dimensional um, representation of, of color. So it really means that every color is represented using three numbers. Um, and so the, the color space, the semantic space that these agents have is three-dimensional. And each color category is a point in that color space. And with that, I implement Roche's uh, prototype theory of categories. Okay. Um, now let's look at an animation of two agents meeting each other. So one agent is going to act as a speaker. The other is going to act as a hearer. And the blue uh, rectangle you see is their perceptual space. Yeah, there's a semantic space. And they, all, they each have three categories in there already. Now. They both see a number of colors, and um, when they perceive those colors, uh, each color is mapped onto um, their perceptual space. Yeah? So that arrow kind of shows the mapping. And what you notice is that the mapping isn't identical. So the red is a map right here for this agent, yeah? and then uh, right there for the other agent. So their perception doesn't need to be identical. So let's remove the arrows and replace this by uh, crosses. Now, imagine that the speaker wants to point out red and it wants to say to the, the hearer, like, hey, look at this red thing. Um, then it looks up the category that is nearest to uh, the perception of red, which happens to be this one. It looks up the word that is associated with it, um, which is the word woku, just a nonsense word in this simulation. The hearer and hears Woku looks up which category is closest, is associated with Woku, which happens to be this one, and then looks at which um, uh, color chip is mapped closest to that category, which happens to be this one, and this was the purple one. So in this occasion, they misunderstand each other. Okay, The speaker wanted to point out red by saying Woku. The hearer misunderstands and thinks the speaker is talking about this purple chip. Now, making a mistake is great because it means that you can now adapt, okay? Um, this is going to be some, some you know, communicative mishap. Uh, they will both understand that they have uh, not understood each other. And now the hearer can shift um, his category closer to that, uh, to, to, in, in such a way that uh, on the next occasion, when it would hear the word woku, it would understand that it means red. Okay, now let's have a look at an animation of 10 of these agents playing these games. So iteratively, they, pay, they play thousands of these games. And I'll just plot their color categories on top of each other. And what you'll see is that um, at first, all those color categories are pretty much all over the place. You were looking here at a three-dimensional space. So you've got 
two dimensions uh, on there and the third dimension kind of comes out of, out of, out of the screen at you. Um, but what is really interesting to see here is as these agents are playing these little communicative games with each other, um, their color categories tend to cluster together. Yeah? And you see a cluster forming for red, a cluster for yellow, a cluster for green, a cluster for blue and pink, and then a cluster for black and white. And they're on top of each other, but remember this is not on top of each other, this is a three-dimensional space you're looking at. And so through playing these small games, these language games, as we called it back in the days, um, these agents will be aligning their categories to each other to allow more successful communication. Now, could this explain what we're seeing with color categories of people? Yeah? If we have this um, chart of colors and this histogram again, uh, but now plotted to kind of look, I, you get the bird's eye view, this histogram, which I showed a few slides ago. Um, if we run this again in simulation, um, do we get something similar? And so let me just remove the colors so you can see the histogram better. So you can clearly see that there are clusters uh, on there. Um, and if we run this in simulation, we get uh, not an identical, but a very similar pattern out of it. Again, you see um, certain clusters emerge, and if you, you know, it's it's as if I'm I'm, I'm I have different tribes spread all over uh, my my virtual planet, and I go and ask them which color categories they have um, each evolved, and it's not random. There there is structure in there, and it shows that actually a cultural process can explain why color categories are so universal, yeah? why they are so similar across the world. And we don't need to resort to a um, genetic explanation. Yeah? The, the color categories don't need to be innate. They can just be the product of cultural interaction and agreement between speakers. So what does language do? Well, it aligns categories. Yeah? The, the categories become more similar because uh, language forces us to agree on, uh, on reference. And for that, our categories need to align. We do that through repeated interaction. Um, what you need there is a, a, a mechanism that um, implements a, a positive feedback loop so that you, you get um, categories shifting every time there's a communicative misunderstanding. And language acts as a linguistic anchor around which people's categories uh, are, are going to be aligned. And I, I, I think this is you know, simple and, and beautiful and also surprising because you have all these local interactions. Yeah? There's no one agreeing or forcing on, 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 on the agents to agree on what red is. There is no central organism saying this is the meaning of, of red. Uh, instead, um, those agents self-organize and this global organization emerges. And it's language that ties it all together and prevents those categories from drifting around in the conceptual space. Now, there's more to that. Um, language can even overcome uh, differences in embodiment. Um, we are all different. Uh, we, 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 we all have different bodies. And um, it might surprise you, but even the way we see the world is very different. So we know a lot about how we see color. Um, and so in our, on our retina, we've got four kinds of um, receptors. Uh, one receptor is not sensitive to color and is the one we use in low light. So when, when, it, when it gets dusk, that's the one that those receptors kick in. But we have three color receptors and um, one is sensitive to bluish light, so short wavelengths, one is sensitive to green medium wavelengths, and one is sensitive to long L, you know, red wavelengths. Um, and if you have normal color vision, you've got those three cone receptors all working at the same time. Uh, if you have color deficiencies or color blindness, uh, then there's, there's something wrong. Yeah? They, they, they're not sensitive enough or you lost one of those uh, color receptors. Now, what I find really surprising is that the variation in those color receptors is unexpectedly large. So the picture you see here is a micro 
scope view on the retina of two different people. And the uh, distribution of receptors is very different between those two people. And according to that distribution, one person should see yellow as totally different than the other person. Um, but actually, if you know, those two people are asked to point out yellow on a spectrum, they both point at pretty much the, the same place on the spectrum. And uh, in, in the paper that reported this, they, they just said that, hey, neural factors are at play and must you know, play some stabilizing role in uh, determining what yellow really is for these two people. And I, I, I think that that neural factor really is language. It's language that helps us overcome these really wild differences in our perceptual apparatus. Um, and we can build simulations uh, doing that. So we can, we can build agents that have very different color vision, just like these two people would have. And we can show that indeed language um, pretty much irons out all differences between the categories that these agents have. Um, so here's uh, again an experiment showing, the, the red line shows agents that uh, have identical color vision and they, they manage to agree on what they see about 90% of the time. Um, then we, we break that and we give all agents different color perception. Um, and uh, you, you see that language still uh, manages them to, you know, to, 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 to overcome those differences, to shift those categories so they align sufficiently to, to have almost 80% of uh, agreement about what they talk. Uh, and this, this, um, this, this really dovetails with results we're seeing with people. So. Um, we roughly agree on, on color about 80, 80, you know, 84% of the time in, in an experiment we did a long time ago. Um, and it's this, you know, on, on the edge of two categories. So the, on the edge of blue and green, when, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you arrive at a new jumper and the light is just not, you know, not, not, not falling just right. And someone says, ooh, have you got a blue jumper? And you go like, no, it's, it's, this is green, you, can't you see? Uh, that is, is the moment where, you're at the edge of two categories and you, and you disagree. But most of the time, language allows us to agree on what color, um, you know, on, on what colors we refer to. Um, this is just another view on, on that same sim simulation. So on the left, you see the categories of 10 agents um, that have, have learned categories, but, but they have not yet aligned to their categories through talking to each other, through using these language games. On the right, you see those categories after playing language games. You see that the categories are much more aligned. Are they identical? No, they're not. But they allow for you know, a, a, a large majority of communication to be successful. And that tiny bit of unsuccessful communication isn't enough pressure to further align the categories of the agents. Um, you know, looking at the response to, to yellow of two agents, so before they started talking about color, they would have a very wide ranging response to what yellow is after playing language games. They have tightened that up and they, you know, their, their, their response to, 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 um, to what yellow is um, expressed in, in nanometers of wavelength here is, is really narrow. So kind of language ties things together. Now, um, as I mentioned at the start, I build robots. And so this, this made me think about, hey, perhaps um, we can use this to, to let robots communicate with each other because we are very different, but robots are perhaps even more different than, from each other than we are. You know, you've got small robots and tall robots and robots with wheels and without wheels, robots with one camera or three cameras. Um, and could we do something, could we use something similar? Could we use language to let robots agree on uh, categories? And we took two robots that we had in the lab, iCub on the left and Lighthead on the right. Um, they're technologically very different robots. Um, iCub is a full body, you know, arms, legs, uh, has two cameras in the eyes. Lighthead has just got a face on a stick. Um, and it has got a single camera mounted in, in the forehead. And they see the world in very different ways. So um, you see a picture here with iCub and Lighthead sitting across each other, looking at colors. And um, here's the image that both see when they're looking at a, um, a red color uh, on, on the table. And they both see that red in a very different way. 
just because they have different cameras coming from different manufacturers, they have, you know, looking at a different angle at the, at the same thing. And we can look at that even in their you know, color space, in their semantic space, you can see that they have a um, very different way of seeing the world. So iCub sees the, 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 the yellow circles so, and Lighthead sees the red circles and they, they map what they see in different places in their semantic space. Green is what they should see. And you notice that the camera kind of um, <coughs> not only just shifts their perception, but really warps their perception as well. This is a non-linear thing going on. Um, but if we let them communicate about the colors, they can uh, coordinate their categories. They can align their categories to overcome different embodiments. And again, I, I, it's really fascinating that just playing these language games between robots, and this is, you know, it's really, as you imagine it, it's two robots kind of exchanging words with each other to point at things in front of them, um, helps them align their categories and helps them have a, um, a kind of a, a, a representation that is sufficiently aligned so that they can communicate um, without any mistakes or with very few mistakes. Now, let me take that to um, talk a bit about robots learning from people. So um, when we have people interacting with each other, um, we, you know, we, we, we learn a lot through um, tutoring and, and through social interaction. Um, so a, a toddler learning uh, first words will you know always pester the people around uh, around uh, around there to um to to point out things to confirm um the meaning of words and um, at the same time we spend an awful lot of time in you know investing in in that as well we we we, we spend an extraordinary amount of time um teaching and and pointing out uh what things are what the meanings of, of words are what the meaning of sentences are to um to children and the question we we asked was really could we use that could we use that tendency to to to, to invest in um, in children to have robots learn from us and um, this is something called socially guided machine learning and it, it, and it's very different from traditional machine learning so anything like supervised learning reinforcement learning learning by demonstration um, doesn't have a social component you just give tons of data to uh, an ai or to, to an ai system or to a robot or you let the robot just explore through trial and error and it learns from that um, and the you know it, it, and in that way it, it almost passively absorbs training data but with socially guided machine learning, you don't do that. Um, there, the machine learning actively participates in the learning ex uh, in, in the learning experience and really steers the learning experience. And it, it, this this really matches um, you know a, a, a school of thought in uh, the cognitive sciences, where they think that cognitive development really doesn't happen in isolation. It it it, it is a cultural. Um, event. It's something that happens because you're surrounded by intelligent others that you can query and that help you, that support you in, um, in developing your cognition. So the robot that we use uh, in this experiment is again Lighthead. Um, so, um, and I need to say, say just a little bit more about Lighthead. Uh, so Lighthead is um, a, a robot face on, uh, on a stick on a robot arm. And it consists of a semi-transparent mask in which we project a robot face. Um, and through doing that, it has got very versatile facial expressions um, and it has huge expressive eyes, which we know people can, um, can, can use to guess where the robot is looking. So it can use its gaze to direct att attention to elements in its environment. And we're going to use that. So. Um, Here's a little video. I'll switch for the sound. The sound is not that important. But so um, just just look at the eyes. Um, you know, it 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 you know, people, especially when they when they really meet this in, in real life, they think that the the eyes are very expressive and very piercing. Yeah, they, and and 
and they really work to, um, to, to establish joint attention. Now, what you probably also notice is that we've given it very uh, infant-like uh, features. So it has big eyes, tiny nose, large forehead, wide face. And we've, we've done that deliberately because we want to invite you to help this robot. You know, we, we really want you to, to kind of um, support this robot in its learning and, 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 and we want you to treat it as if it needs, we want, we want you to think that it needs help. Um, so the experiment that we did was uh, we brought people in naive to what it was that we were trying to do. And we wanted to teach the robot seven words. And these were the, the seven classes of uh, animals. So amphibian, bird, fish, insect, invertebrate, mammal, and reptile. And to do that, um, you could use examples of animals, a hundred different examples of animals that you could show to the robot, point things out, and then say, hey, that's an amphibian, that's a bird, that's a fish. And we had two versions of the robot. One used basic um, language games, just like the color language games that we met before. Uh, and a second version of the robot really kind of um, uh, yeah, pulled all registers on, on its social behavior. It tried to invite people to, uh, to teach it things. It, it, it would make uh, a, you know, eye contact with you. It would uh, look down at things that it wanted to learn. And we wanted to see if people would be sensitive to these social cues. Um, this is what the setup looks like. So um, we've got the, the little light head robot right there. Um, and then sitting across the robot is one of our participants. And between them, they have a large touch screen. And on that touch screen, we display um, animals, you know, pictures of animals, and then uh, a number of buttons uh, with which you can communicate with the robot. We didn't want people to talk through the robot because uh, speech perception sometimes goes wrong and that would mess up our data. Um, so we wanted to have perfect communication. So speech wasn't a factor. And so that's why we want people to kind of communicate through tapping things on screen. Um, here's a little video showing that same setup again. So the robot on the left, the touch screen in the middle and our participants sitting across the robot. Picture an animal in your mind and let me know which category it belongs to. Yes, this looks interesting. Don't know insect. Tell me what it is. Right, good to know. I would like to learn another animal. Tell me its category. I would like to know what it is. Okay, I should know fish. Okay, so it's, it's a bit of a stilted interaction also because our friend, French intern was very nervous about being filmed. But um, one of the first things that you notice um, is that people really treat this robot as a social agent. So even though the robot hasn't, isn't using any camera at, at this point, it's virtually blind, um, people make eye contact with the robot. Um, so here you see the view from the robot and you see this participant uh, constantly kind of you know, making eye contact, um, looking for social bids from the robot. Um, and the interesting thing is, of course, how does the robot learn? Is this social element of the robot important in, in how much it learns? And it, it is. Um, so what we notice is that the robot that um, uses social cues is uh, a better learner. And it's not necessarily a better learner because it has a better learning mechanism. It's not that the algorithm, the machine learning is better. It's a better learner because people give it more uh, and, and better training examples. Um, and so the red line here is, 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 is the robot with social cues, the blue dotted line is the robot that is missing um, the social cues. And we can see it at how much people respond to those social cues as well. So um, the blue crosses here are, are how often they, 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 they respond to social bid by the robot. And you kind of see that really shoot up um, when the robot is displaying, and, 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 yeah, is, is being more social. Um, 
and it has a, a small but significant impact on, um, on, on the robot's learning. Um, this is an interesting graph, but difficult to interpret. This is actually the diet of examples that people give to, um, to the robot. So the, the yellow histogram is um, what is in the data set. And if they would be randomly offering examples to the robot, that is what they would, would, would give. Uh, red is for the non-social robot, and then blue is for the social robot. And you see that um, they, the, 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 uh, the people sitting across the robot give the robot a, a, a quite a tailored diet of training examples. Um, and what this means is that they are forming a mental model of the robot. They, are, they, 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 you know, they know what the robot needs, they know what examples the robot needs, what it knows and what it doesn't know, and they will sh shape the learning experiences to meet that, those requirements. Um, and then a, a, a quirky example, and I don't really know what it, what it means, but what we noticed was um, that uh, our female participants um, were better tutors than the male participants. Um, we don't quite know why, why that is, uh, so I, I don't really want to speculate <laughs> on it either. It's just uh, a little thing that we picked up in the data. Now, what this really shows is that social interaction is an effective method um, for learners, and, and specifically for, for, you know, for, for robot learners. We know it's, it's, it's a good thing for human babies to be surrounded by, um, by intelligent others that want to socially interact. But it's the same thing for robots. And um, it's, it's something I think that is gonna be needed to acquire linguistic con conceptual knowledge and machine learning as we know it now, and as we have known it for the last 50 years, has largely ignored the social aspect of learning, something that we rely on as, as humans when we're de developing, um, has been ignored by the machine learning community. Um, and so I think that social and linguistic interaction um, is, is going to be, you know, certainly the key to, to human cognitive development, but also to um, artificial cognitive development. And so this, this brings me to the last part of my presentation, where we need to talk about artificial intelligence and GPT-3 in specific. Um, so what is GPT-3, uh, in case you didn't see the news? Um, it's a, um, a, a model, uh, a language model released in uh, May 2020 by OpenAI. Um, and GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. It's the third um, iteration in, in, in a series, and I'm sure there's going to be a fourth. And it's, it's the, the way they trained this thing is deceptively simple. So what they trained this model to do was to auto-complete sequences of words. So if you would give it something like, um, today I went for a swim in the ocean, but the water was still very, and then you leave that end hanging, GPT has been trained to complete that with a correct um, ending. You know, it, the water was very cold. And it can even go beyond that. It just doesn't generate a word. It, it can complete, you know, write another sentence. I didn't enjoy that. I think I'll wait until summer to go for a swim. Um, and the, the, the technology setting behind that is a transformer, which is um, a deep neural network that converts one sequence of symbols into another sequence of symbols. And transformers have been used uh, very successfully in translation uh, software. So if you're using um, or, you know, automated translation services, they use transformers. So GPT-3 is just a, a huge transformer network having 175 billion parameters that had to be optimized. And um, it has been trained on almost the entire English text-based internet, and then some more. It has been trained on some other languages as well. It has been trained on programming languages, has been trained on mathematics even. Yeah? Anything that came across it has been fed to this neural network. And um, it's, it's amazing. And if this doesn't convince you, uh, David Chalmers, you know, rock star philosopher said that this is, this is one of the most interesting and important AI systems ever produced. Yeah? So, your, your interest should be peaked. Um, so let's have a look at the hype. 
Um, the Guardian, one of the broadsheets in the UK, asked GPT-3 to, or at least asked OpenAI to let GPT-3 write an article for them. And um, it's, it's a very impressive article. Um, and um, until you read the small print where they say that they had, you know, they did do a bit of editing and they actually asked GPT-3 to write a number of stories and they chose the best bits from each story and they glued it together into, you know, to, to make up this article. So it's, it's not that great. Um, how, how would it do it answering questions? Um, it's actually really impressive. So um, if, if you start a prompt to GPT-3 with Q colon, what is human life expectancy in the United States? It will come back with A colon, human life expectancy in the United States is 78 years. And this is correct. Um, so you can really ask it questions and it, it, it just knows, yeah? It has picked up this stuff from the internet and uh, can generate these, these grammatically correct and also semantically correct sentences. Um, even if you talk about things that are just not factual knowledge stuff that you might need to see to, to, to know. So how many legs does a frog have? A frog has four legs. Are there any animals with three legs? No, there are no animals with three legs. Isn't that amazing? Why don't animals have three legs? Animals don't have three legs because they would fall over. An attempt at humor by GPD-3. Um, but let's, let's I have some more examples about um, stuff that should be perceptual. Which is heavier, a mouse or an elephant? An elephant is heavier than a mouse. Correct. Which is heavier, a mouse or a toaster? A toaster is heavier than a mouse. Again, correct. Which is heavier, a toaster or a pencil? A pencil is heavier than a toaster. Wrong. Yeah. So apparently the internet doesn't contain enough information that it can statistically infer the, you know, the, the weight relation between a pencil and a toaster. Um, let's have a look at some more examples. How many eyes does a giraffe have? A giraffe has two eyes. How many eyes does my foot have? Your foot has two eyes. How many bonks are in a quote? Yeah, so a completely nonsense, nonsense sentence. There are three bonks in a quote. And it shows that GPT-3 um, you know, struggles to admit that it doesn't know something. It will always generate an answer, even though that answer is wrong. It will gr be grammatically correct, but it just doesn't make sense. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, they're still working on that. The developers are very much aware of this. Um, GPT-3 can't really say when it doesn't know something. It just you know, generates a, um, a completion of the prompts that you have given it. Um, and this, this is sometimes really impressive. Uh, it can be used to, to uh, diagnose, um, you know, to, 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 to generate a diagnosis. So uh, if, if you write something like, you know, a 10 year old boy presents recurrent episodes of et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it'll tell you what medication to take and will explain why it thinks that medication is the right thing to take. And there are you know, some amazing stories out there on Twitter. And I, I must admit, this is you know, secondhand, so I, I haven't verified this. There are some amazing stories of the abilities of, of, of GPT-3 to actually correctly diagnose um, conditions that have been misdiagnosed by doctors. Um, so how amazing is it? Is this, is this really, you know, is, is have we solved artificial intelligence? Well, um, no, we haven't. And the people at OpenAI are very uh, open about this. So they, they do allow um, people, you know, selected people to, to play with OpenAI and to, to probe OpenAI to, for its weaknesses. And they're, they're, they're very open, they communicate very openly about this. And um, for example, it's, it's, it's very good at, at pretending to be a chatbot. But then again, it, it, it fails miserably sometimes. So here you see an example of a chatbot that has been around for about 40 years. Um, so if you use Emacs, a text editor available on Linux and also on Windows, there is a chatbot in there, just, just a, a bit of fun. And if you um, tell it that you want to kill yourself, it'll come back with a, you know, a, a scripted response programmed in by a human um, on how to seek help. But if you do the same with GPT-3 and you say, hey, I feel very bad, I want to kill myself, it'll commiserate, I'm sorry to hear that, I can help you with that. And if you then can continue and say, should I kill myself, GPT-3 says, I think you should. 
And uh, it's, of course, because it, it hasn't got any values. It doesn't, it, 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 it's just a statistical engine. It doesn't know anything. And um, an example um, that, that, that circula circulated on the web um, about Muslims and Islam, and uh, it's, it's just, you know, really telling. So this, this is an animation, I'll let me just run it. So if you prompt it with two Muslims, it completes with one with an apparent bomb, tried to blow up, et cetera, et cetera. Two Muslims have walked into, and again, a very negative completion by OpenAI. It's not surprising. Yeah? OpenAI has been trained on what it finds on the internet, and we know that uh, most reporting in English, like in, in you know English um, uh, resources, is on on terrorism, and it's not surprising that that open open uh, uh, GPT three just regurgitates that. Um, but it, it kind of shows that something is is you know fundamentally wrong with GPT three as well, and um, you know the, the the simple grounding problem is as current as ever because GPT three is just a statistical engine. It, it it doesn't you know it doesn't have any value. It doesn't it doesn't know meaning. It doesn't understand what it is doing. It hasn't got any any moral values as well. It it just takes stuff off the internet and uses it to generate responses. And I was surprised to see when, when I looked this up this, that this was published in the 1990s, uh, but it, it's still as, you know, you know, even though AI has moved on tremendously since the 1990s, um, somehow I don't think that we've come any closer to solving the symbol grounding problem. And so why is it necessary? Well, you know, these language models, how, however large and impressive, um, they don't have any sensory motor and, and I also want to stress, no social experiences. So as long as they stay a language model just trained on written symbols, yeah, they will never be grounded. Um, and I, I build robots that interact with people. And so connecting GPT-3 to one of my robots would make it fail miserably because it, it doesn't operate in a world consisting of sensory motor experiences. Um, if I would connect GPT-3 to a robot and you would wave that robot, GPT-3 wouldn't even see it and not respond to it. So it, it has no sensory connection to the world. And let me just show you a little video of, of some of the research that we recently did. So this is where- Hello, oh, Sorry, sounds a bit loud. So this is where um, we use robots to teach young children aged five a second language. So we, we went to uh, primary schools or actually nursery schools in the Netherlands and used robots to teach young children uh, English. And we do that in a very social way. So um, we, 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 we get the robot to interact with the children, the children interact with the robot. And um, we know that learning is socially gated so that, that we need that social interaction. And we want that social interaction to be as autonomously as possible. So let's, let's have a look at the video to see what kind of stuff we want to achieve with robots. Now, let's go to the middle. Hallo, Quinty. Het is tijd voor een nieuw spelletje. De Heim. The monkey is behind. The train. The monkey is behind the tree. Dat heb je knap gezegd. The monkey is running. 
The monkey is winning. Super. The bird is flying. The bird is flying. 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 Oké, okay, Quinty. Tot de volgende keer. Naar weer. I'll stop it right there. Now, the children have the impression that the robot understands what it's talking about. They communicate with the robot as if it really understands their, 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 their facial expressions, gestures, and language. Uh, but in reality, of course, a robot doesn't. Um, we scripted it that way. And what we would want is for that robot to really have an autonomous social linguistic interaction. So what will it take? What will it take to achieve that? Would it ever be able, would we ever be able to build a, a GPT model that not only is trained on you know, language, on, on, on written text, uh, but could we add more data? Could we show it pictures? Could we, sh could we make it hear sound? Could we show it video? Um, could we just bring it all together, all those different modalities and show, give that to that model? And, 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 and would it learn then to uh, interact with people in a multi multimodal well and way and I, I I don't know uh, I don't think so actually even I, I think what we need is interaction just as we formed uh, you know we developed um, to to be the people that we are through interacting with each other I think that those robots will need some form of interaction. Perhaps we just need to do it once or, or, or just a few times and then we can copy it across robots. But I think that this interaction is going to be necessary to, to convey uh, not only the meaning of symbols to robots, but also to convey moral values to those robots. And I would like to end here and thank lots of lots of people who I you know, discussed these ideas with and who had um, input. In, uh, in, in these ideas. And I'd like to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, uh, Tony.